Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. In this special six-part summer series, you will hear recordings of papers delivered at the Robert Menzies Institute's conference on the Menzies Ascendancy, Implementing a Liberal Agenda and Consolidating Gains, 1954-1961. to The conference was held over two days from the 23rd to the 24th of November, 2023. In this final episode of the summer series, you will hear from Dr Stephen Wilkes on falling dully on his ears, Menzies Balti and the travails of Australian federalism, followed by Dr Lyndon McGarrity on Menzies Queensland and the 1961 election, and finally, Professor Gregory Malouche on was Menzies lucky? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I must say I more than suspect that some of us may think of Robert Menzies in his prime as being largely unchallenged from within his own party. But consider this from the founder of the Australian Financial Review, Jack Horsfall, um, about that other eminent Victorian, Henry Edward Bolte. Menzies held no fears for him. The Labor Premiers of Queensland and New South Wales marvelled at his audacity. Well, Henry Bolte is, I think, the leading Liberal of the Menzies era, apart after the eponymous Prime Minister himself. John Howard wrote uh, that, in my experience, the affection and respect for Bolte among Victorians, especially those of a Liberal persuasion, was second only to that for Menzies. Now, I hope to write at length about Bolte and gratefully note assistance I should include from former of his MPs, Ian Smith, Alan Scanlon and Jim Taylor. Their recollections notably contradict the claim by biographer Peter Blasey that Bolte emulated a dictatorial conception of leadership practised also by Menzies. Bolte and the Victorian division of the Liberal Party sorely tested Menzies' conception of the Australian Federation by challenging uniform income taxation, the practice whereby all income tax is levied by the Commonwealth, some of which is reimbursed back to the, or was reimbursed back to the states. Introduced by the Curtin government in 1942 as a temporary wartime measure, the details of uniform taxation can be quite eye-wateringly complex. And I refer anyone keen on those to uh, Matthews and Jay's 1972 Federal Finance, which I must say is a more interesting book than it sounds. But in short, although a state could readily legally impose its own income tax, Curtin made the reimbursement grants back to the states conditional on their ceasing their own income taxes. This withstood a high court challenge uh, from four of the states in 1942. Menzies himself proposed something a little bit less heavy-handed in 1941. And during his post-1949 ascendancy, largely maintained Curtin's model, the economist J.J. Pincus, rather head-scratchingly, I think, called Menzies a pragmatic centralising federalist. Anyway, uniform taxation now sits alongside the engineers' case of 1920 as a major step in the centralisation of policy and fiscal power. Bolte in wanting income tax returned to his state was not one to be appeased by uh, special extra grants here and there, so-called supplementary grants from the Commonwealth, or tinkerings with the formula for Commonwealth reimbursements. Nor was he unduly deterred by the political implications of resurrecting state income tax. His complaints constitute, I should say, a political ally's most strident contemporary questioning of Menzies. Yet Menzies' biographies attach little significance to dealings with Bolte, or for that matter, the other premiers. And those of Bolte cast federalism almost entirely in terms of his spectacular clashes with John Gorton. Now, there are some non-biographical accounts of federalism under Menzies. Uh, Campbell Sharman, for example, his chapter in the Menzies era of the edited collection, 1995, summarises the fiscal facts and figures. And John Roscombe, who's, I understand, noticed not here at the moment, in the 2006 Samuel Griffith Society proceedings provided a, an incisive assessment by a committed federalist. <laughs> 
Now, I'll focus here on the tensions of federalism under Menzies and how uniform taxation illustrates his balancing of party principles with the pressures of national government. Now, Menzies' return to office in 49 seemed to offer the likelihood of the restoration of pre-war taxation arrangements. In actual fact, on a few other issues, was Menzies so frequently accused of compromising party principles, and not just by Henry Bolte. He managed this by putting the onus for change onto the six states, the six squabbling states, while being seemingly open to their guidance. Menzies is most understatedly effective. Now, a few words about these two individuals. Both hailed from small-town Victoria, but Bolte very much remained of the countryside, whereas Menzies became largely, I think, urbanised. Although the avowedly poorly read Bolte does not obviously lend himself to an analysis of intellectual influences, both were educated within a similar set of cultural values. The cultural puritanism that Stephen Shavira and Greg Malouche here have written of. Like Menzies, Bolte stood more for practical government than overt ideology. Menzies nonetheless retained a more distinct tinge of idealism, notably, as we've heard, in education. Both deeply respected the institutions of government and both, incidentally, are among the few major post-war political leaders to have resigned or retired at a time of their own choosing. It's been pointed out that Menzies has un had unusually wide experience of the vagaries of federalism, both sides of the fence, a former deputy premier and as a lawyer in the engineers case and also in Victoria's challenge to the Bruce Page government's use of Section 96 tied grants, one of Menzies' less successful court cases. Interestingly, Bolte believed Menzies in other contexts favoured his native Victoria. And Exhibit A here was that in 1965, Menzies declined to assert exclusive government control, sorry, Commonwealth control over Bass Strait oil and gas. Uh, Victoria got a very nice cut of the royalties as a consequence. And Catherine West, in her Power in the Liberal Party, wrote that Menzies had an unspecified but, as she put it, intense the taste for New South Wales. Electorally, the two leaders knew full well that they benefited decisively from each other. Yet there's a frequent caginess in what Menzies ever said publicly, and occasionally I noticed one, at least one occasion privately about the Victorian Premier. His farewell when Bolte retired in 1972 was decidedly underwhelming. A jolly good Premier, even when I had a few problems with him. The lingering problem in their relationship was the calculation of the Commonwealth reimbursements. Under Curtin, initially, these were based on average income tax collected by each state in about in 1931 to 41. Now, this disadvantaged Victoria, just to start with, because Albert Dunstan's country party government of the time imposed low taxes and provided correspondingly limited social services. Now, in January 46, the Chifley government, in declaring uniform taxation permanent, it's here to stay, folks, also decided to slowly tr transition by about 57, 58, to a more needs-based formula for reimbursements. Now, again, I'm going to avoid the complex uh, details, but overall, the formula favoured what I can say, I perhaps hope I can be forgiven for calling the poorer states, such as by taking account, for example, including in the formula, population density. The idea being that people living in remote areas were far more costly to service. Now, Victoria's relatively high population density helped maintain its sense of having been dudded. Um, even when the Liberal Party was being formed, Menzies does seem, and again, this has been fairly widely noted, to have been a little ambivalent about scrapping uniform tax. In his Forgotten People talks, he did not assume a firm, a firm um, stance on this tax. 
This is despite uniform taxation not sitting obviously very well with his form of liberalism. It centralises power and it muddles accountability by imposing vertical fiscal imbalance. It was left more to the Liberal Party organisation to generate early rumblings via its Victorian and Federal Councils. Now, Menzies, as Prime Minister after 49, described uniform taxation as thoroughly unsatisfactory, 1952. But at the Premier's conferences of 50 and 51, he signalled preparedness, preparedness rather than intent, to restore state income taxes. But he placed the onus squarely on the states by proposing that each nominate a percentage addition to income tax collected within their boundaries by the Commonwealth for their own purposes. At the 52 conference, he added a few conditions, uh, notably for the restoration of state income taxes being such that the total level of income tax was to remain nationally uniform. And of course, Western Australia and Tasmania, with their then shallow tax bases, we're talking about a very different Western Australia in those days, flatly opposed this. They were better off with the existing reimbursement system. So Menzies effectively, any, effectively ended any likelihood of restoring state taxes at the a special premier's conference of February 53, from which he later concluded that it was most unlikely that uniform tax would end unless there arose a revolutionary change in the opinions of governments. Only the Victorian government, then headed incidentally by John Cain Senior, seemed interested. So when Bolte became Premier, June 1955, uniform taxation looked pretty well set in place, yet he launched at once a direct challenge to the Commonwealth Government. Now, he was the only Premier in Menzies' heyday to seriously do so. He objected that uniform tax restricted his ability to respond to growing demands on his fast-growing state, on services and infrastructure provided. Now, all states during the 40s and 50s faced rising demand for services. There was a, a population bulge, meaning we had more kids going to school, students studied for longer, hospital services expanded and total, total populations grew. But also, Unlike many state levied taxes, Commonwealth income tax has been described as a, a fairly classical growth tax. It tends to be quietly boosted by progressive tax structures and rising incomes. Now, there are statistics and there are statistics on just about everything. But most data seems to confirm that Victoria was indeed worse off than other states in a, on a per capita basis. And this was quite persistent throughout the 40s, 50s and 60s. And even so, even in his policy speech for the 55 state election, he was just opposition leader, that brought him to power, Bolte inconveniently promised to secure the return of income tax for his state by taking up Menzies' nominal, nominally still on the table offer to return the income taxes. In June 55, at his first Premier's conference, having been Premier for just under three weeks, the precocious Bolte public described Victoria's reimbursements as hopelessly inadequate. And this is when Menzies responded, again, in classically disdainful language, dire warnings that the state's faced ruins fell dully on my ears. It's actually a quote I figured out from Ruskin, Menzies being a uh, poetry enthusiast. Which didn't deter Bolte in the least, who formally wrote to Menzies, offer, accepting, formally accepting your kind offer to re, on the table nominal offer to return income taxes. Damn, what a pest! And then followed up with an absolutely breathtaking letter. I've got a copy here if anyone's keen. In September of that year, absolutely berating Menzies for a system that will destroy and deny the power of a state to raise revenue, aggravated by high immigration. That was the Commonwealth's fault as well. And he said, this, it was the very antithesis of the maintenance of, in, of the independence within their respective spheres, spheres, I should say, of the constituent bodies politic, which together go to make up the federal Commonwealth. That was obviously drafted for it. That's not sound like Henry Bolte speaking, but you get the idea. 
He effectively wrote Menzies off in the same letter by concluding, I see no alternative to another High Court challenge, which duly happened. He drove this almost single, or his government drove this single-handedly, albeit with the extremely insipid participation of a reluctant Premier Carl of New South Wales. And indeed, in August 57, the court, by and large, held up its, held, sorry, upheld its 1942 ruling. Now, in June 58, the story continues. Bolte tried to convene a special meeting of premiers only for Menzies to maintain that the Commonwealth would readily fall in with some scheme that is agreeable to the states, but pointingly adding in the same breath, criticism for New South Wales was not made very violently. No more Menzian understatement. Now, nor was help provided by the Liberals Federal Council's policy research group, made up of MPs and partly officials, established in 56 to review our principles which must constantly inspire us, chaired by one W. McMahon MP, affirming in 57 that uniform taxation was unlikely to be abolished, Labor premiers obedient to their party line would never go along with it, and concluded, this is significant I think, Uniform taxation served the national interest as a means by which the Commonwealth, here's the quote, influences the balance and direction of movement of a national economy, preserving it from dangerous fluctuations. So there's a macroeconomic Keynesian thing working in there as well. Indeed, Victoria's persistence by this time was succeeding mainly in stoking prime ministerial ire. Uh, Menzies was sufficiently concerned to agree to a the party's uh, executive, federal executive proposal to appoint a liaison minister of each of the states. And poor old Harold Holt copped Victoria. I'm not sure what quite worked out there. And at Menzies' behest, the federal president of the party, Lyle Moore, noted centralist in fact, according to his ADB entry, so it must be true, sternly warned in writing the president of the Victorian division, Rutherford Ford Guthrie, does anyone remember him? Rutherford Guthrie, that you're threatening party unity, back off. And the Baltic government's last push was a solo effort in 59 when the Chifley formula, formula was expiring. Menzies agreed that there's, okay, there's something really wrong here, we've got five out of six states appealing to the Grants Commission for separate special um, grants, as obviously this ain't working. The outcome was a significant adjustment in Commonwealth reimbursements. Victoria accepted the new formula, but with reservations. They actually had two premiers conferences on this to get it worked out. And at the second one, Victoria was represented by Henry Bolte's trusted, indeed much loved, deputy Arthur Ryler. He signed on for Victoria. Now, Bolte was overseas at the time. He was, one fascinating little thing about Henry Bolte, he was running his own little foreign policy as well, probably the first Premier to do so, not the last. And when he got back, Bolte soon quickly realised that the big states had lost out badly. This is because the WA, Tassie and South Australia had most of their 58, 59 special grants, additional to the reimbursements, included in the base for the calculation of their new formula to last up to 65. Um, and so Victoria's per capita payments, they went up a little bit in absolute terms, but they went down quite noticeably um, in uh, percentage terms, in per capita terms. So, Menzies' approach to policy and the law, I must say, was never rigidly prescriptive. It should, he felt, be cognizant of the growing needs of the growing community. And indeed, uh, it was in this vein that throughout the 50s, he had considered the basic settings for fe the Federation. By about 1960, his views had well and truly settled, and he delivered his fullest public statement on federalism. In doing so, rightly or wrongly, he dispatched uniform taxation to the Museum of Great Australian Lost Causes, alongside new states and bank nationalisation. September 1960, the Alan Hope Southie Memorial Lecture, delivered at the new Wilson Hall, about 40 metres that away. Menzies began with a nod to his party's principles, opposing control from Canberra's properly applied a good instinct. But he added national consciousness should have priority. And indeed, the return of taxing powers to the states was, would be pregnant with disaster. <laughs> 
So what he wanted, had largely achieved, was a fine balance of two great goals, that the growing, again, Menzies speaking again, same speech, that the growing financial power of the Commonwealth is exercised in a way as to permit the states to discharge their own constitutional duties, but without excessive emphasis upon purely local rights, which is proving such an impediment to the creation of a truly national sentiment and pride. He was avowedly stating his commitment to the post-war consensus about a fiscally strong central government that could manage a national economy. Now, near the end of his premiership, Bolte described his failure to end uniform taxation as my greatest disappointment. Menzies, he said, was no more a Federalist than Gorton, an absolutely dire Boltean insult. And he rightly attributed this to Menzies having never been truly tested by six unified states. Now, his audacity probably had a lot to do with, federal par with the Liberal Party's very strong state divisions. We've touched on that earlier in these uh, last uh, two days. Unlike the ALP, where the Federal Party could directly intervene in state branches. But these two Liberal heavyweights managed their tensions. Bolte limited public crit criticism of Menzies to issues of fiscal federalism. The debate also shows that the still pretty new, raw, young Liberal Party, and it's only around for about a decade or so when Bolte became Premier, could cope with significant disagreements within its ranks. The in-principle regard for federalism gave state leaders a certain latitude, up to a point, to remonstrate with the Commonwealth. Yet the prediction by Bolte's other biographer, Barry Muir, was that the uniform taxation case was one with which his name will be forever synonymous was wrong. It's actually obviously, we all know, it's the Ryan hanging for which he remains known for. Now, Bolte's assessment at Menzies' support of federalism was a little bit harsh. Was a, sorry, at Bolte's... Sorry, we'll start again. Bolte's assessment that Menzies' support for federalism was nominal is a little harsh. The persistence of uniform taxation, I think, qualifies but does not invalidate... David Kemp's view that Menzies had a lifelong belief in the federal system, reflected in his haste, I think, in his hastening slowly in using Commonwealth tied grants to universities and non-government schools. Another thing which I noticed has come out in these last 24 hours or so. Menzies was rightly cautious about the ready use of tied grants, which have since eroded Australian federalism. Now, uniform taxation was Menzies' foremost pragmatic compromise of the ideals of liberalism. He usually preferred to let an issue unravel itself over time. It's pragmatic Menzies on full display, learning the pros and cons, making the odd concession, and keeping an ear cocked to political reactions. And finally, his actions did not resolve federalism in Australia. I mean, such will never be achieved, nor should it. I actually welcome this ongoing tension. By preserving diversity and competition in government, federalism, I think, makes our own little political universe so much more interesting. Thank you. Nineteen sixty one was a significant year in Australian political history. Crucially, the Queensland electorate swung dramatically away from the Menzies government in the nineteen sixty one election, a swing which almost resulted in Menzies losing power. Somewhat shocked by the results, Menzies told the press that in Queensland the electors have come to believe, and I think quite wrongly, that Queensland has had a poor deal among the states of the Commonwealth. Unquestionably, on polling day, the people of Queensland felt Queensland was a neglected state. In making this statement, the Prime Minister was acknowledging, somewhat belatedly, the political impact of his government's perceived national indifference to Queensland priorities in areas such as defence and economic development. This paper investigates the extent to which the claims of Queensland neglect had substance, the role of the perception of Queensland neglect in the uh, federal poll of 1961, and how that pivotal election altered the political relationship between the coalition government and Queensland.
While each state and territory had their own complaints about Canberra-centric government, Queenslanders have arguably been the most vocal in expressing a sense of neglect since Federation in 1901. There are a number of reasons for this. In the first place, while many Queenslanders live in geographical proximity to the most powerful states in the Commonwealth, namely Victoria and New South Wales, Queensland remains on the edge of the national conversation except around election time. This sense of being ignored by Canberra, and for that matter Brisbane, doubles, triples and quadruples the further north you travel. Although amenities have improved remarkably since the 1970s, Queensland's sense of physical and psychological isolation from down south remains part of the political landscape. Much of the notion of Queensland neglect gains its energy from resentment at ambitious infrastructure projects being refused, delayed or postponed by the central authorities. However, the perception of Queensland neglect is also an expression of anxiety about whether the state measures up to its southern counterparts. The theme of Queensland neglect became more prominent on a national scale following World War II. The wartime decision to make the Commonwealth the sole collector of income tax increased the financial and political power of the federal government. It raised expectations that the central authorities would play a larger role in supporting state infrastructure projects, and Queensland subsequently competed with other states for Commonwealth subsidies. However, the Menzies government took a cautious approach to investment in ambitious state infrastructure, although it could sometimes be inconsistent. For example, it, it inherited the Chifley Labor government's Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme and funded it generously. The scheme became popularly regarded by Australians as a nation-building project, although its main beneficiaries were parts of Victoria and New South Wales. The Queensland government and its citizens framed many of their post-war infrastructure proposals as having not just regional significance, but major national significance as well. Queensland Premier Ned Hanlon, for example, argued in the 1940s that constructing a Burdekin River dam with Commonwealth backing would not only assist local farmers, but was a strategic necessity um, to protect Australia's northern approaches from future invasion. Confronting an unenthusiastic Chifley, Hannon insisted that, and I quote, the Burdekin River is much more important to the safety of Australia than is the Murray River. The Japanese are safely put away for a generation, but they have not been put away for all time, end quote. Chifley offered only lukewarm support for the proposal, which was quietly shelved when Menzies swept into power. Queensland associations like the Cairns Chamber of Commerce also suggested that the development of a military base in North Queensland would not only increase regional economic development, but would benefit the nation by being in close proximity to potential Asian enemies. For much of its time in office, the Menzies government rejected such proposals as irrelevant, arguing that while most Australian troops were stationed in the southern states, they had the capacity to be deployed at a moment's notice if there was a military threat. That's not to say, however, that the uh, Menzies government during the 1950s ignored funding Queensland economic development altogether. For example, it continued to fund scientific and agricultural research in Queensland conducted by the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation and the Bureau of Agricultural Economics. The federal government also greatly assisted the growth of Queensland pastoralism through a 1951 agreement between Australia and the UK, uh, guaranteeing a British market for Australian meat for 15 years. This gave northern producers a sense of economic stability. The, the, the Menzies government was nevertheless content, wherever possible, to take a back seat while private enterprise developed the more isolated parts of North Queensland. Uh, 
During the 1950s, for example, North Queensland's mineral resources were attracting unprecedented attention from companies and investors. Having prospered in World War II because of the, de of the demand for copper, Mount Isa Mines was a major employer and northern success story during the 1950s. Furthermore, the Comalco Company began preparations for mining bauxite on the west coast of the Cape York Peninsula near Weeper. Comalco's mine boasted 2,000 million tonnes of recoverable ore reserves, as bauxite was the raw material for aluminium, as used for numerous commercial applications, including household items and constructions, the Kamalco investment was shrewd. Any parochial resentment over favoured projects being rejected for Commonwealth funding did not seem to have much impact on the Queensland federal election results between 1949 and 1958. The the ALP's internal divisions, including sectarianism, undoubtedly had an impact on voters. The majority of Queensland House of Representatives seats during these years were won by the Liberal Country Party Coalition, reaching in 1958 a peak of 15 out of 18 seats. Between 1959 and 1961, however, the issue of Queensland neglect was accentuated in political debates. This was partly due to heightened tensions between the new country party dominated coalition government in Queensland and its Commonwealth counterpart. Elected in 1957, Queensland Premier Frank Nicklin hoped to ramp up funding for economic development. Between 1959 and 1961, Nicklin sought federal support for a large number of projects designed to assist Queensland primary industries. These included an all-weather road from Mount Isa to Townsville and a gravel road between Laura and Weeper, neither of which attracted Commonwealth funding. Menzies did, however, agree in 1959 to support the reconstruction of the Townsville to Mount Isa railway line with a £20 million loan. Nicklin publicly, publicly described the Commonwealth's offer, offer as niggardly and delayed signing off on the deal. Other Queensland politicians echoed Nicklin's sentiment. In 1960, State Development Minister Ernie Evans criticised the uh, Menzies government's neglect of Queensland in the Legislative Assembly. He subsequently claimed that Queensland-based Supply Minister Alan Holmes' lack of interest in his own state was well known. Member for Gregory Wally Ray also argued that a great break existed between the Commonwealth and Queensland, claiming that when a federal parliamentary delegation, including Deputy Prime Minister Jack McEwen, visited the Channel Country that year, their attitude was, the sooner we get out of here, the better. By August 1961, Nicklin was furious. Menzies claimed to be astonished to receive a telegram from the Queensland Premier, which read, and I quote, recently announced rail aid to Western Australia and South Australia has brought instant and violent reaction comparing so much grant aid in those cases with proposed absence of aid for Queensland, end quote. On 31 August, Nicklin and Treasurer Tom Hiley met Menzies in Canberra to iron out their differences. They subsequently re released a statement claiming that misunderstandings had been removed. The Mount Isa Railway Agreement, unaltered, would be signed off by Queensland and the Commonwealth would contribute up to £5 million for the construction of Queensland beef roads. Later in November, as the federal election approached, the Menzies government announced that the Commonwealth would provide a £100,000 loan plus a £100,000 grant to improve port facilities at Gladstone for coal loading. If Menzies had hoped that such firm commitments would shore up support for the coalition in the December 1961 election, he was sadly mistaken. According to the Brisbane Courier-Mail, the offer of help for beef roads came so late as to look like a pre-election sop. Further, with one exception, state politicians representing country party electorates refused to campaign with the federal coalition. Possibly annoyed at his failure to get a better deal on the Mount Isa Railway, 
Uh, Nicklin was in the audience when Menzies spoke in Brisbane but did not share the platform. There was some substance behind the Queensland perception of a neglected state. A Prime Minister's Department briefing for a Queensland visit by the Acting Prime Minister noted in 1960 that in recent times, Queensland's share of Commonwealth loan funds represented about 11.7% of the total amount available to the states. Subsequently, in 1962, a Treasury official remarked that Western Australia appeared to be more favourably treated than Queensland because the huge expanse of WA made its road grants larger and more expensive than other states. The Commonwealth's actions in November 1960 to, to drastically reduce inflation also impacted sharply on Queensland compared to other states. Among other measures, the Menzies government imposed tight restrictions on loans and increased sales taxes, particularly on motor vehicles. As a result, a notable rise in bankruptcy and unemployment occurred throughout 1961. There were 71,115 people unemployed in Australia in January 1961, rising to nearly 116,000 by the end of the year. Queensland had the highest percentage of unemployed by 31 December 1961, with 4.5% of the workforce out of work, compared to the national average of 2.8%. The higher unemployment levels were in large part due to the lack of diversity in the economy, with Queensland focused more heavily on primary industry. The Commonwealth's economic restrictions also exacerbated the effects of drought conditions experienced in parts of Queensland. Having adopted what one key advisor called a policy of masterly inactivity, the Menzies government did not alter its economic belt tightening policy in the lead up to the 1961 poll. It gave Queenslanders and Queensland politicians time to worry about the future. The recession came at a time when the northern state was in transition. Because of bulk loading of sugar, there was less work on the wharves. Mechanisation also reduced the need for manual labour. Sugar towns were well aware, for example, that mechanical harvesting would soon take the place of cane cutters. In addition, with rising numbers of electors on unemployment benefits and a decline in revenue, Premier Nicklin was feeling the pressure, complaining to Menzies that, and I quote, we are running out of official capacity to we are running out of official capacity to spend at a sufficient rate to attract your matching grants for roads and university, end quote. Despite the economic recession, Menzies appeared supremely confident in the days before the election on 9 December. I am unable to discern any swing against my government, he claimed. In Queensland, I have been delighted with the large attendances at my meetings and the enthusiasm of my supporters. He was to receive a rude shock. The coalition won 62 seats to Labor's 60 seats, which meant that once the Speaker had been elected, the Menzies government ruled the forthcoming term with a one-seat majority. This paper-thin majority was made possible by Queensland MP Jim Killen, who only narrowly won his seat. Notably, the greatest swing towards Labor was in Queensland at 10.21% compared to 5.30% in Australia overall. Having previously won only three out of 18 House of Representatives seats in the 1958 federal poll, the ALP in Queensland won 11 seats in 1961 compared to seven for the Liberal Party Coalition, Liberal, Liberal Country Party Coalition. Defeated Liberal MPs suggested that one of the central reasons for the electoral setback in Queensland was that they had found it impossible to overcome a conviction that the federal government had neglected Queensland. Reflecting this perception, the Courier Mail published a cartoon of Menzies in the bathroom having had his morning shave. He was depicted applying after-close shave lotion. <laughs> 
a lotion which had ingredients such as more awareness, more nationwide thought and development. A figure peering through the door representing Queensland was shown telling the Prime Minister to rub that stuff well in, Bob. Coalition politicians also acknowledged that Labor in Queensland had run a tight and well-disciplined campaign. In its appeal to Queensland electors, Labor took advantage of both the unpopularity of the Menzies government's economic policies and the theme of Queensland neglect, which ironically had been highlighted by the state's country party politicians, Menzies' supposed allies. This dual approach was shown in Labor's electoral advertising in which voters were urged to put Queensland back into Australia. Vote ALP. Deputy Opposition Leader Gough Whitlam also used the Queensland neglect theme, combining it with the argument that the Commonwealth was neglecting the whole of Northern Australia. Whitlam's whistle-stop tours to Northern districts may have been one of the factors which led to Labor regaining seats like Kennedy and Herbert from the Coalition. As Bill Hayden remembered, Whitlam dazzled the Queensland electorate. He mesmerised the Northerners with visions of rivers being turned inland and running backwards, of dams and roads littering the vast and sparsely populated top end of the country. Thereafter, Queensland loved Whitlam. Whitlam's economics might have been fractured, but his vision was perfect. It was this vision which helped get me elected." End quote. After the 1963 election, however, Labor lost three Queensland House of Representatives seats in South East Queensland, and the Menzies government subsequently held 10 out of the state's 18 seats. This improved performance might have been partly due to the coalition's efforts to improve its overall image by reducing sales tax on motor vehicles, uh, increasing unemployment benefits, and restoring a 5% rebate on income tax. Queensland electors may also have returned their votes to Menzies because a change of government might have seemed risky following the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of John F. Kennedy and other unsettling world events. By the first election after Menzies' retirement in 1966, the coalition's majority was even higher, notably securing the North Queensland seats of Herbert and Kennedy, previously held by Labor. The fact that 12 out of 18 lower house federal seats in Queensland were in coalition hands after the 1966 poll can be explained by two main factors. First, with developments such as the sealing of the Bruce Highway from Brisbane to Cairns and the opening of a university college in Townsville in 1961, Queenslanders, Queenslanders, especially in the major coastal towns, were now much less isolated from the rest of Australia. Secondly, between 1961 and 1966, the Menzies government displayed a clear public commitment to major Queensland projects, including the Beef Road Program and the Brigalow Land Development Scheme. Further, the 1964 decision to build an army base in Townsville gave Menzies' successor, Harold Holt, a means of expressing the coalition's championing of Northern development at its opening in 1966. It's likely that the shock of the 1961 election result encouraged the Menzies government to successfully address the issue of Queensland neglect in its funding policies. However, since the Menzies era, the issue of Queensland neglect has remained politically potent. Improved transport and the internet have reduced physical isolation, but a Queensland sense of isolation from the centre remains. Often coupling it with the theme of Northern neglect, Australian politicians such as Gough Whitlam and Tony Abbott have periodically returned to the issue of Queensland neglect over the decades to shore up their personal following and, more importantly, to gain public support in the Northern State at election time. Thank you. When I think of, uh, of luck, uh, I think of fortune or Fortuna, which is, of course, the classic Machiavelli statement on fortune or luck. Uh, 
I conclude, therefore, that fortune being changeful, changeful and mankind steadfast in their ways, so long as the two are in agreement, men are successful, but unsuccessful when they fall out. For my part, I consider it better to be adventurous than cautious, because fortune is a woman, and if you wish to keep her under, it is necessary to beat and ill use her. Oh, God, Mackie will get in trouble these days, wouldn't he? Sorry, I'm kidding too. Uh, beat her. Um, and it is seen that she allows herself to be mastered by the adventurous rather than those who go to work more coldly. She is therefore always woman-like, a lover of young men, because they are less cautious, more violent, and with more audacity command her. Um, Menzies actually proves Machiavelli to be wrong. He was not young, he was not actually adventurous, and he certainly wasn't violent or audacious. But he did actually manage to do a very Machiavellian thing he managed to avoid the contempt of the Australian people. And in Machiavelli's view, it is the one thing you must always avoid is contempt. So I've got a very, a bit of a strange argument. I want to start off with some criticisms of Menzies made during the Menzies period. Uh, John Douglas Pringle, editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, wrote a book called Australian Accent. The Herald always disliked Menzies. Uh, and Pringle was one of a series of English editors they had of the Herald. His judgment was, this is 1958, well read and cultured, he is a man who prefers to rely on the knowledge acquired in his youth rather than seek out new knowledge in his mature years. As a result, he seems often out of touch with the temper and thoughts of today. To sum up, he is a supremely successful politician, ruthless, adroit and cunning, whose special device is to pose always as a statesman. Ah, so there he gets another Machiavellian thing. He gets the appearance right. It's actually more important in politics to get the appearance right than to get the reality right. He also comments on Evert. He has said so many different things at different times. Ah weak opposition leader. Colin Clark, writing in um, Australian Hopes and Fears about the same time, Mr Menzies' governments have had an almost continuous record of failure to take the right action at the right time. And he describes Menzies as a, as a barrister prime minister who thinks when he's won the case, he's actually done something. In other words, he's good at the words, but again, that's in Machiavellian term, that's fine. He's good at speeches, but not necessarily good at action. And coming back to what um, Paul Kelly did refer to at the beginning of the conference, the Donald Horn, the lucky country, who, who actually has a lot to say about Menzies. The positive characteristics of the age, the spread of affluence, the considerable relaxation in social styles, the increase in national self-assurance, his attitude has been largely nostalgic. With policy making slowing down and sometimes stopping, the permanent heads of the government departments get on with the job of administrating departments in a way that will not cause trouble. Ah, so he's a good administrator. But this fits in, of course, with what we were saying about the incremental stuff. He is essentially arrogant, although courageous, with a scorn for most other men, perhaps all other men. He uses his power to little purpose. But Horn comes to the, 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 the great conclusion, again, as with with um, uh, Clark and, and Evert. Corwell is even more antediluvian than Menzies. So, uh, well, there wasn't much of a choice. He's seen few of the potentialities. So the implication is that Menzies is all talk and action. A man who simply administered the country without any real vision. He was a good showman while practising Masterly in action. Masterly in action, I think, is a Sir Humphrey term, isn't it, from memory? Masterly in action. Uh, he was fortunate in facing two opposition leaders who were even worse than he was. This is meant as a criticism, but was it? And was his masterly in action really such a bad thing? So the criticisms that the sort of... And these are not people of the left, by the way. Horn was not a man of the left at this stage. Pringle was, I don't think, was a man of the left. Clark was sort of a Labor Party person in a funny sort of way. Um, but they weren't, they weren't hardcore lefties making, making comments about him. So what, I, what have I got next on my... Uh, mm, ah, I've probably done things, but I can never see what I did. That's all right. 
That's all right. Okay. So what I want to invoke is the idea of the forgotten people, who I think were more than a rhetorical advice and were certainly still around in the years 1954 to 1961. I think the forgotten people are actually a real group. I think they're actually a real, a real group. I think my parents were the forgotten people. My father had crappy clerical jobs during the 1950s and then bought a, what was known as a mixed business in 1961. So, And I also think is that who were the forgotten people? What strikes me as emblematic of the forgotten people were the bank workers who came out to protest the attempt by Chifley to nationalise the banks back in 19. 47. There were, I suspect, more women than men who can be counted as amongst the forgotten people. They were the generations, and I think we have to remember, when we're talking about the 1950s, we're talking about people who grew up a lot earlier, went through a lot more, and I'll go a little bit into this. They were the generations that I've come to depict as practising, in Justice Higgins' words, modest comfort. They were the generation of modest comfort. They did not have a lot. They had been through privation. They had been through the trauma of two world wars and the Depression. They knew how to practise frugality as a part of their everyday existence. And this was a society and culture that was very different to our own. Very different to our own. So, credit was very limited. This was an age when thrift and saving, this is actually the beginning of the age of credit. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but it was a still when people saved up and bought things. That was an age when saving. The standard of living was considerably lower than today. The range of foods was quite limited. There was no fast foods. Remember, Kentucky Fried Chicken was the first fast food outlet in Australia. It didn't happen until 1968. So what was there? It was the age of puddings and sponge cakes. Uh, you could get Geoffrey Blaney on to see much better than this on me. There were basically very little in the way of supermarkets. It was interesting talking about, about the building of the mall in Canberra in the early 1960s. Well, you know, malls are 1960s things, totally different shopping habits. In many states, not most, many states, some states there was still six o'clock closing of hotels, particularly Victoria and South Australia, of course, which were the wows of states. Uh, but in New South Wales, they got rid of this in 1955. You could, at the, the end of the age of the six o'clock squill, 1955, right in the middle of everything. Sabbatarianism was in force. People forget the age of Sabbatarianism. Uh, one of the things I came across, apparently at the 1959 um, Billy Graham crusade, they couldn't sell the songbooks for the crusades on a Sunday because it was illegal to sell the books because book selling was illegally to sell on a Sunday. And of course, it was the great, the great age that when you travelled on a Sunday, you could only buy a drink if you were a bona fide traveller. You could not buy a drink anywhere else. Shops were closed, everything. This, and you know, I, I could make, of course, the joke about Ava Gardner and the end of the world uh, coming to Melbourne in 1959, uh, but probably because Melbourne was always more Sabbatarian than, than other parts of the country. Uh, naughty books were banned. Um, you know, this was the 1950s, the famous Eugene Goosen's incident where he got into trouble for bringing um, what was deemed pornographic material into the country. Eugene Goosens, yeah, everyone knows who Eugene Goosens was, I take it. He was a, you know, a conductor and everything, yeah. Um, and then there was the tyranny of distance. I think this is a society, I think, you know, Judith Brett's right, there was this moral middle class which sort of maps onto the forgotten people. And I think the forgotten people are basically lower middle class, they, they live. And the, the, the thing that's interesting here, um, I was born in 1954, so end to 1961 when I moved, but I was actually born in the electorate of Barton. Who was the member for the electorate of Barton in the mid-1950s? <laughs> the leader of the opposition, 
Mr. Everett. Gee, gee. But I think the Barton was actually a place, that area was actually a place of the forgotten people because just north of Barton is a suburb called Irwood. And who was living in Irwood in the 1950s? Sorry? John Howard. It was actually, you know, it's to do with St George and Canterbury and various other things. Irwood was always considered a cut above the suburbs around it at the time. But, uh, so it was basically a middle brow, um, see how I'm going, I don't want to, a middle brow culture. And I think, I think, as described by David Maloof, who was, of course, living in Queensland at the time, and he gives this picture of, you know, what there was a homogeneity of, of culture in terms of food, in terms of entertainment, late, fit, early 50s, people stayed home and played cards, different sort of culture. Families sang together around the piano on Sunday nights, and... You know, all these various things to do. And as, as Maloof argues, this was a middle brow culture. And Menzies, I think, was middle brow. That's why he appealed to the forgotten people. He wasn't Evert. Evert was, you know, avant-garde art and other things. Menzies liked landscapes. He could relate. So given what happened after World War II and the Depression, I think there's a great fear of economic good times would be followed by times of economic dearth. And this belief, I think, runs right up to the middle of the 1950s. The concern consumed those during World War II who feared a post-World War, War slump because of what had happened after World War I. But then in 1955, I think the age of prosperity was declared. And Menzies stated at this point that the problems facing the country were those of prosperity and not depression. At the same time, the treasurer, Artie Fadden, stated that wage growth in increased consumption, including the expansion of higher purchase, were creating problems for the economy. And I think this leads to what I would describe as the Pax Moderna the, across the Western world, as it becomes affluent. This happened right in the middle of, right at the beginning of this period. You get the Pax Moderna. People are getting more affluent. It's the years in which we're dealing that prosperity really takes hold. And, but I should point out that what I'm talking about as prosperity in Australia is what Gen Z today would regard as austerity. So, so, and so this report in, in Treasury, 1956, we are like a family that has been spending not only the whole of its earnings, but also the money it has in the bank, spending it partly to enlarge the house uh, and acquire other durable possessions, but partly to have a good time. So, no, what do we, uh, I, I can't see where I'm, Anyway, anyway, uh, so the growth of credit in the 1950s. Outstanding advances of higher purchase companies rise from $187 million in 1953 to $824 million. 24 million, 520 million of new higher purchase agreements in 1959. Two thirds were used to purchase new and used cars with most of the rest used to purchase household goods. So, and also the number of people taking out mortgages rises during the 19, 1950s. So my point is that the Menzies years saw a very significant shift, these particular years in Australian culture, especially in economic attitudes. It's a time in which a culture based on modest comfort was replaced by one based on prosperity. It's a slow process, but in material terms, gen genuine. As those of you who have read Tacitus and Seneca will know, the challenges of prosperity are as great as those of, of uh, dearth. So, if I, uh, where am I here? Ah, there it is. So, what did, they, what did they spend? What did prosperity in the second half of the 1950s mean? It meant watching machines. It meant refrigerators. People used to have ice boxes. Even when I was young, my mother still had a washer you know, with, with, you know, um, ring washer where you rang the clothes out. But they actually got real washing machines. They got televisions. They got brick veneer houses into the 60s. They got motor vehicles. So Australia was still, it was still largely comfort. So what I'm trying to argue is that Australia is still quite conservative in its cultural habits 
in the 1950s. There's still the forgotten people there, but they're transitioning to prosperity. Have I done something? Oh, prosperity. Um, so, and it's still around. And it's one of the great facts of the late 1950s. What was the great event of 1959? What event actually had, third, up, it's claimed, up to 30% of Australians go there? The Billy Graham crusade. Never appears in the history books, of course, because they're not interested in it. So the moral sort of thing is still, still there. It matches the royal visit. So in the period, in the period, 1954 to 61, the age of prosperity or Pax Moderna begins, but the Australian people are still living in a modest age of modest comfort, having gone through two wars and a depression. They were moving down the road to a consumer society, but still wary of that world and what it had to offer. Menzies was the ideal leader for those circumstances, I think. Reliable, reassuring, he instinctively developed a political style appropriate for the times in which he lived. He was criticised by the academic economic profession because he did not seek to engage in economic planning, preferring to rely on Treasury and its advice. That he was masterfully inactive is not a criticism. I think it suited the time. Why wouldn't one keep the best aspects of the regime that he supplanted, along with the best public servants available? In this period in particular, he was the Prime Minister for the Forgotten People. There was no real pressure to engage in reconstruction, which was yesterday's dream. Social engineering, that was very 1940s. The Australian people rejected, rejected social engineering when they only took on the social welfare part of the 1946. There would have, the, that, that disabled a lot of the possibilities for social engineering. The 1949 election, Confirm that. So I agree with David. The Australian people are actually naturally liberal. They're not naturally Labor in that respect. They did not want vast social engineering. And, so, and Reconstruction was a, was a flop. So, and as Whitlam proved a decade later, to be a Prime Minister who wanted to reintroduce Reconstruction in a way, um, that's, an, uh, that's, 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 a, that's no great thing. So that leads to 1961 and the so-called credit squeeze. It was, in fact, I think, it's interesting, it's called credit squeeze. When it, I, as I understand, it's actually the first recession of Pax Moderna. It's the first contemporary recession brought on by overheating the economy, stimulated by growing consumption based on the extension of credit. It proved to be almost terminal for Menzies' government. Perhaps here, Menzies did have some luck but it was luck that came out of his capacity to master fortune and to avoid contempt. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 